while Samara's getting set up, he, he's been a graduate student of mine for a few years. He, he was in my CAD class that I taught when I joined UTD. And uh, I was very impressed because he had finished all the homework, I think, in the first couple of weeks. And so I said, you know, you should do some research and, uh, you know, in your spare time. And, and uh, so I think he gave it some thought and eventually became a PhD student. He's done extremely well, published several papers. Um, and in fact, we're going to submit another journal paper this evening that he's been working on. And uh, so he's going to graduate this spring and he's going to be a postdoc sticking around with us uh, for probably till the end of the year. Um, and uh, and aside from that, he's uh, a, an enthusiastic cyclist. So if any of you are into road biking, you know, uh, get in touch with Sumer and he can he can give you all the ins and outs of uh, how to achieve uh, an average speed of 30 miles per hour or something like that. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Sumer. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Malik. So today's presentation is going to be on building finite element simulations to predict the influence of metal additive manufacturing microstructure on post-process treatment. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through four different topics. We're going to cover the thermal simulation from which we can predict the melt pool and heat affected zone in metal additive manufacturing. Then using that predicted melt pool and heat affected zone, we're going to try and predict microstructure using something we call the dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo simulation. Once we've run the dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, we'll incorporate the microstructure that we get back into Abacus as something we call a representative volume element. Um, and that's in the Lagrangian system. If we use an Eulerian system, we'll use something called a material volume fraction. If any of you are unfamiliar with Lagrangian or Eulerian, I will be covering that today. Uh, finally, once we replicate the grain structure in our, final, in our finite elements as an RVE, we can then examine the effect of microstructure on post-processing um, operations such as laser shock peening, milling, or laser impact welding. So to begin with, uh, let's look at how we predict melt pool and heat affected zone in metal additive manufacturing, and also how we can use that to predict our microstructure using the dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo. Um, this is based on a paper that we uh, published recently. Uh, just to give you an overview, we build an SLM thin walled specimen. From that, we predict the heat affected zone and the melt pool, the heat affected zone is what you see in brown, the melt pool is what you see in red. Once we get the dimensions for that, and I'm going to cover all of this um, in more detail, but once we get the dimensions for that, we feed it into our dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo uh, simulation from which we can predict microstructure. And just to explain to you what the difference between dynamic and regular kinetic Monte Carlo is, you can take a look at these two images. With the regular kinetic Monte Carlo that Sandia came out with, you basically get this very uniform grain structure throughout. And it doesn't really factor in the effects of intra and inter layer heat accumulation, whereas the dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo does. So this should give you an idea of what our simulations look like. And what I have over here on either side are views from the top, that's A, B, and C for different layers and different scan lines. And then E, F, G, and H are views from a cross section taken in the middle for the same layers, layer one, layer six, and then different scan lines. Um, based on this, what we want to do is we want to extract something we call the thermal history. So thermal history is what you see in these graphs over here. What you see in the graph on the left is the thermal history for just one uh, layer. If I then Take, if you look at the time, if you look at the time scale on the graph on the right, you basically see the, the thermal history for all of the layers taken from one particular layer. And that's why they look like they're getting smaller. Um, we take this and then we assess what is the melting temperature for the metal and what the recrystallization point should be for the metal. And then based on that, we assess where these isotherm limits actually are. So what you see over here are isotherm limits for the melt melting points, everything within this boundary, within the bright orange boundary, is anything that exceeds, any spike that exceeds this point. And anything within the brown boundary is any spike that exceeds this line over here. 
Um, using the dynam dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo method, what we can do is we then predict the microstructure, which continuously evolves. So this is the microstructure we see during layer one. This is the microstructure we see at the end of printing all the layers, but this is for layer one um, in two different regions, region number one and region number three. The reason we're plotting two different regions is because this is our thin walled specimen from the top. And if you notice, region one has three boundaries where it's exposed to the surrounding powder. Region number three only has two boundaries where it's exposed to the surrounding powder and two boundaries where, where it's exposed to surrounding solid metal. So the amount of cooling in both these zones is going to be different and it will obviously have an effect on the heat accumulation, which thereby will influence the grains that are predicted. Um, what we also do is we try to predict, we try to do an elliptical fit and figure out what the major and the minor diameter for each grain is. We use this to then predict the hall patch yield strength, uh, which I'll come to later on in the presentation. So this is what it looks like for layer one. This is what we get for layer three. This is what we get for layer five. And what you see on the, on the right are basically graphs that help us quantify what the major diameter to the percentage grain fraction is, just so we can compare the different layers. Um, what you see on the, on the left over here in the slide is your regular KMC running. This is a simulation by a colleague of mine called Ritten Matthews. And these are the same three layers I just showed you, but you see that uniform uh, almost uniform grain structure that is being predicted. So it doesn't really factor in that heat accumulation, uh, interlayer and intralayer heat accumulation, which has been noticed through SEM imaging. Um, now that we have our dynamic kinetic Monte Carlo microstructure, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we import that back into Abacus as a representative volume element or a material volume fraction depending on whether we're using a Lagrangian system or an Eulerian system. Um, the difference between the two, let me explain to you, is a Lagrangian system is when you take your workpiece and you literally break it up into small little elements, hence we call it finite elements. In an Eulerian system, which I'll get to later, what you do is you simply have a three-dimensional grid in space and you throw an object into that grid and as the volume of that object cuts through the cells of the grid, you can track the volume. So that's the only difference. In the Lagrangian system, the mesh is on the object. In the Eulerian system, the object moves through a mesh, through a virtual mesh. So this is based on a paper which we will probably be publishing in the near future, probably next week. It's on importance of microstructure modeling for additively manufactured metal post-process simulations. And in this, uh, we talk about laser shock peening as well as micro milling, which is what you see in the pictures on the right. Um, right on the top, you see the different yield strengths for the grains. Each grain is rebuilt in, inside Abacus using um, all of the elements that are encompassed within the spatial location of the grain that we predict via dynamic KMC. So in short, if I know where the centroid of an element is in space, and I know it falls within a particular grain in space, I will assign all of those elements to that particular grain. So this way you can see how I've discretized numerous grains, and eventually you end up with a structure that looks like this on the top right. And you can see all the different yield strengths that we compute using the hall pitch equation. On the bottom right, what you see is sort of this influence envelope. So if we use equivalent plastic strain, which is which typically will be found right around the tool workpiece interface, what I've done is I've sort of um, honed in on the region right around where the tool is contacting the workpiece. And you can see the region of influence. Um, the blue is zero, the red is one. So if, if I linearize it, um, it's lit, the influence is literally, is literally zero where, where you see these blue regions and it's one. Um, where the, where the tool is making contact with the material. Um, just to give you an idea of how we built it, uh, we made this SLM simulation. What you see over here is a top view. What you see over here is a profile or a front view of the different layers. Here we didn't model the powder, so to compensate for that, we just created these artificial 
um, convective heat transfer uh, conditions because you won't get conduction, which you would get with powder if it were there. The reason we didn't model the powder is to reduce the computational expense. So we compensated for it by increasing, artificially speaking, increasing the convective heat transfer coefficients. Um, the laser scan that you see over here is modeled using the popular um, double ellipsoid Goldack model. So this model was made in 1984 by Goldack et al. Uh, what it is is basically this elliptical comet shape or semi-comet shape, uh, hem like a hemi, a half comet, let me call it a half comet. And if you look at the intensity, the intensity is divided the way you see this profile on the top. So you have all this intensity right at the top, and then it zeroes out as you move away, as you move towards the tail, tail end of the comet. Um, over here, you see a distribution of all the diameters, of all the major diameters um, for the structure on the left. And what you see over here are the yield surfaces. So what we can do is we can calculate the, this is using uh, max distortion energy of one Mises uh, yield surface uh, criterion. So for a homogeneous structure, if we, if we made all of this using a homogeneous structure, we basically get um, a yield surface which is represented by this blue ellipse. Um, you'd be familiar with this based on courses like mechanical system design from the Shigley's book um, during your undergrad. If we use an inhomogeneous structure like what you see um, on the left, we'll basically get numerous bands. Each band represents a different grain having its own particular major diameter. And the idea is, when the overall state of stress reaches one of these yield surfaces, your equivalent plastic strain will start to monotonically increase. So to give you an idea, this is the milling simulation, the micro milling simulation that we're going to do. Um, these are the boundary conditions. Just to give you an idea of how big the tool is, we, we're using a half millimeter uh, tool diameter to do an end milling simulation. And what you see on, on, the, on the right over here are the effects of, uh, temp of equivalent plastic strain and temperature considering and neglecting microstructure. What you see over here is this top view. So you're looking at this plane on top over here. And I've given it a translucency. So you can actually see through the top view. I've hidden the tool, but you can see the, the tool workpiece interface where the chips are going to form. And you notice there is a subtle difference uh, considering microstructure and neglecting microstructure. It's more visible when you look at temperature. You, you see that the value of temperature as well as the, the, the envelope of its effect changes when you consider microstructure and when you neglect microstructure. Um, when you do a, a milling simulation, you also have to incorporate damage models so the damage models we incorporate are ductile and shear damage models. For ductile, there are two types. One is without considering the effects of temperature. It only considers the effects of strain rate, which is called the ductile damage initiation criterion. The other one which considers the effect of temperature is the johnson cook damage initiation criterion. So we've got these competing ductile damage uh, criterions, and then we also have a competing shear um, criterion because you can have all three types of damage occurring and competing with one another. And then de depending on which one goes from zero to one first will determine how the element gets removed from the workpiece during the simulation. So we look if we look at the, the graphs on top, all of them are considering microstructure. If you look at the graphs at the bottom, all of them are neglecting microstructure. And you can clearly make out a difference in the plots. They're all using the same color scale, which goes from zero to one. So there's a clear difference when you uh, consider microstructure. So what it does is it affects the volumetric material removal, which is what you see in these graphs. So I've taken the exact same slice. This is through the this is through the profile, and this is from the top view. And you notice there's definitely a difference in the in the white space that you're seeing over here which means there's definitely a difference in the material that is being removed at the exact same time step in both simulations. And all of this is occurring simply because we've now considered microstructure. We also notice near the tool workpiece interface, 
the patterns are going to get are slightly different. Um, if we talk about laser shock peening, so we're going to take that same specimen and now instead of milling it, we're going to do laser shock peening. So just to give you an idea of what laser shock peening is, I know Dr. Malik likes to talk about it, but I don't know if he's given you a lecture on it uh, so far this semester. So I'm just going to give you an overview of it. This is a picture from our lab. In this picture, what we're going to do is we're going to laser shock peen this um, metal specimen that you're seeing over here. It has a black ablative coating on it and it also has this transparent overlay which we get through our water supply. Uh, this is our Q-switched laser which um, gets reflected and then goes and hits the target which is what you're seeing over here. What this laser shock peening process does is it creates this plasma which applies a pressure or sends these shock waves through the metal creating compressive residual stress. The compressive residual stress improves the fatigue life of the component. So this is typically something you would see during engine vane um, strengthening. You would see this when strengthening turbine blades. Um, and to give you an idea of what an SEM image would look like of this metal specimen, uh, here's an image we have uh, with, a, with a one diameter sort of a, a width between three different uh, lines of um, LSP. You notice it's not a very, very strong effect, but there is some effect that is definitely being being picked up by um, the SEM imaging. So to give you an idea of what the modeling looks like, here we have our grain structures, again, a cross section, and we have this sort of Gaussian pl um, plasma pressure profile that we build in, in Abacus. Um, how did we get this Gaussian pressure profile? Well, what we did is we experimentally extracted um, data from our lab setup uh, where we were basically counting the photons. Based on that, we um, calculated the normalized plasma pressure, which is basically this red color curve that you see. And we assume that they're both um, proportional. Now, because of the width over here, this the width over here is one millimeter, whereas the width of this shot was, the radius of the shot was 1.6. So what happens is only a fraction of the shot act, actually acts on the top surface of the specimen. So that's what you're seeing with this um, magenta colored zone. This magenta colored zone is nothing but um, the pressure acting on the top top surface of the specimen. And it only it doesn't only act in space, but it also acts with time. In other words, the pressure changes with time. Um, and this is time on the order of nanoseconds, which is what you're seeing with the figure on the right. There's a sharp spike up until you get your peak plasma pressure, and then it quickly dies and reduces considerably um, within 300 nanoseconds. We call that the heating and the adiabatic cooling uh, phases. To give you an idea of the effects that you're going to see with and without microstructure, let's look at the equivalent plastic strain. So basically your laser acted on the top surface. You notice below the top surface, not directly on the top surface, but below the top surface is where you get the most amount of effect. And if I use the same color bar for both, you notice there's a significant difference considering microstructure and neglecting microstructure. So it shows you the importance that microstructure has. A lot of these simulations before this paper was published, before this research was done, would simply assume homogeneous isotropic modeling. Um, and with metals, you definitely have microstructure. So this paper elucidates the importance of considering microstructure. Um, to give you an, an, an idea on how it affects the residual stress that is induced, um, again, this exact same frames considering microstructure and neglecting microstructure um, from the top, from a profile view, and then this is a shear stress view from the top. We notice when you're considering microstructure, you get this very abstract art looking uh, residual stress profile. Whereas when you neglect microstructure, you get this very symmetric looking profile, which is almost unrealistic, but that's simply what all the simulations in the past have given us. They've just shown us these very symmetric patterns. And it's simply because the effects of microstructure were being neglected. If you look at shear stress, you get this very symmetric pattern, but it's about a 45 degree rotation 
um, compared to the other two profiles, which were normal stress, normal stress components. If you look at the shear stress when you're considering microstructure, you notice anti-symmetry. So this again shows the importance of factoring uh, microstructure, or just how much of a difference you're going to see by factoring microstructure. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it over to using microstructure, but in an Eulerian simulation. So this was done through a paper which I did with a colleague. He was his name is Glenn Gleason. He was also a first author on this work, and it's based on simulation of laser impact welding for dissimilar additively manufactured foils, considering the influence of inhomogeneous microstructure. So in a nutshell, um, what we do is we do something called laser impact welding, where basically you have two foils, like what you see in this picture, and we hit the top foil with this laser shot, and we give it enough velocity and enough pressure to collide with another foil and form a weld. Hence the name laser impact welding. So just to give you an overview, what we did in this paper is we simulated an additive manufacturing process for one layer, which was thick enough to model one foil. Well, and we repeated this for aluminum and stainless steel. We compared the grains that we're getting with EBSD images from literature. Then we ran our laser impact welding model to give you an idea of what it would look like with the grain structure, aluminum in blue, stainless steel in red. And we get this me mechanical interlock, which matches with our SCM image. And then if we look at the effects on predicted shear stress, equivalent plastic strain, thermal response, we notice that some definite changes compared to without um, the inhomogeneous microstructure. I'm going to cover all of this. I'm just giving you an overview. And then it also makes a difference when we look at the collision velocity and jetting phenomena. So jetting is what you see um, coming out of the mouth of the weld. So you have this mouth of the weld, which is forming. It's moving from left to right. Um, I've got three frames for the inhomogeneous, which is which are labeled I1, I2, and I3. I've also got three frames for the homogeneous, where you hardly see any jetting, for that matter. You also notice the collision velocity curves look different. So, bottom line is microstructure definitely makes a difference. But let me get into this in more detail. And what I want to focus on is how we made the grains in an Eulerian system. Note the difference from the Lagrangian system that I showed you earlier. So to give you an overview of what laser impact welding is, this is just a, a simple schematic of the setup. Again, you have this confining uh, layer, which in this case is our borosilicate glass. You've got one foil layer, which is attached to it with two-way tape. The foil layer is also painted black. Um, you have another foil layer, which is attached to the solid substrate. Um, and then you have your laser beam, which comes and hits it from the top. You get your plasma, which forms. And what you get is you get this sort of annulus weld, which looks like what you see over here in this optical micrograph. You can also sometimes get this sort of spring back effect in the center. And just to give you an idea of what microstructure in impact welds have looked like uh, through the decades, the images on top were taken in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, the images at the bottom were taken somewhere in the last five years. In all cases, at the interface of the impact weld, you notice there is some change in the microstructure compared to further away from the, from the interface. Um, in this image you see over here, this was an EBSD image um, with IPF mapping. You notice all these different effects like a twin, a twin plane forming, adiabatic shear bands, dynamic recrystallization, static recrystallization. This is very interesting. The reason we see all of this is because the material being used over here was copper. Copper has a very um, low stacking fault energy. And because of that, you get all these exciting effects during that impact well formation. So this was a very nice picture where all of these phenomena were captured in this one frame. And it was by a group, um, I believe, in Ohio State. This was Glenn Dane. Glenn Dane's uh, a leading researcher in laser impact welding, if you want to read about it. Um, from Ohio State. So this was a picture from his, from one of his students' uh, dissertations, master's dissertations. So just to give you an idea, this is our SLM um, finite element model. Again, I ran this with aluminium 1100 as well as uh, stainless steel, um, just to get the melt pool and heat affected zone limits from which we can then run the dynamic KMC and get these grain structures. So we basically 
you have these foil structures, the, the thickness you're seeing over here, 50 micron, is basically in the Y direction. This top face, which you're seeing over here, basically runs along the top face over here. And we get these grains and we compare them. We just compare them for general size. It doesn't have to be a perfect match, but as long as it's a comparable size, we know our calibration for the model is done um, adequately. Um, we'll compare to EBSD images, obviously for the same material and similar or exactly the same SLM uh, process parameters. Um, to give you an idea, this is again, this is the same laser impact. Well, this is the same laser lab, but what we have over here is a difference in the setup. So this over here is our laser impact welding setup. So the inset image is slightly different. Um, again, you see the two foils, you see the substrate on which the lower foil, the stainless steel fo foil is mounted. The aluminum foil, which is attached to the um, transparent overlay is painted black. And you have a laser coming in and hitting it um, from the negative Y orientation. And the result of that is this weld that you see over here in this inset image on the bottom left. An idea of this of how we build our finite element schematic. What you have is an Eulerian grid. Again, this grid exists in space, it's not attached to any of my foils. What I then do is I then define my foils within the grid. I'm defining the foils as a volume. What you're seeing over here is a homogeneous system. I've not put the grains just for simplicity. Um, the rigid bodies you see in, on top just represent the borosilicate glass and the metal substrate. And then again, I apply my um, plasma pressure, just like I did for LSP. It's very sim It's exactly the same. Um, here we build a symmetric simulation for reducing the computational expense. So instead of having um, the double plus the double magenta on both sides, I just have half of it, um, and that's what you see over here. Again, we also have the same um, adiabatic cooling and heating profile to model the temporal profile of this plasma pressure pulse. Um, just to give you, an, give you an idea of what the grain structure would look like, this is how we define our grains. So these grains are being defined now as volumes. They're not being defined as elements, they're being defined as volumes within that Eulerian grid. So these are the different volumes. Each grain is a volume of aluminum on top. That's what you see in blue. And in red, you see the, the grain volumes for stainless steel. The first picture you see on the left is at a frame T0. That means before the laser pulse is applied. And then T is equal to 550 on the right, which means well into the, the laser impact weld formation. You see all that jetting on the side. And if we zone, if we zoom in to the, the interface, we notice this sort of mechanical interlock that we're getting or predicting. And just to compare, I've also attached an SEM image. Now this SEM image I will note is from a it's not from an additively manufactured foil, but you should still get the interlocking. It may not be exactly the same, but just to give you an idea, if you notice the interface, you, you sort of see that interlocking phenomena occurring. And the, the color schemes I've used over here are based on the different yield strengths, which are again, as I mentioned before, determined via the hall pitch relation. Uh, we noticed during, during, the, during the well formation, you notice a lot of um, shear effects and stretching in the grains of aluminium. So just to examine what's happening along these grain boundaries in our simulation, what we did is we plotted the, the grain aspect ratios. That's basically the, if you think of an elliptical fit, that's just the ratio of the major diameter, capital DI, to the minor diameter, that is lowercase di. And at T is equal to zero, we get this histogram over here of aluminum. At T is equal to 550, we get the green color histogram. Um, so you notice there's a definite difference. It's almost threefold, an almost threefold difference for aluminum. Likewise, for stainless steel 304, it's almost a twofold difference um, between T is equal to zero, which is the red histogram, and T is 550, which is the blue histogram. To give you, this is quantitative, so to give you a better visualization of what's actually happening, we took two grains which um, share a boundary and we marked um, two volumes or two Eulerian points um, just to see how far apart they would stretch during the simulation. 
So at t is equal to zero, they align, but at t is equal to 550, these points have separated. And that just shows us that you have this stretching and shearing occurring or grain boundary sliding occurring um, at the boundary or at the interface between these adjoining grains. To give you an idea of what happens with the shear stresses now, again, with microstructure, without microstructure. Uh, firstly, you notice there's a difference in the color bars. Um, secondly, you'll notice there's a difference in the actual pattern that we're getting. So again, that shows us how incorporating a microstructure makes a difference in the prediction. Uh, again, to give you an idea of how it affects the equivalent plastic strain, what we've done first is we've plotted the von Mises yield criterion or max distortion energy yield criterion. Um, for, for, the, for the inhomogeneous structure, what happens is you'll get this banded effect. And what you're seeing over here is not a surface. It's, a, it's actually multiple ellipses. It's so many ellipses that it looks like a surface. Um, the big one is for stainless steel, obviously being stronger than aluminum. And then the smaller set of um, bands is for aluminum based on our um, yeah, based on our hall patch um, empirical relation. We also took uh, relationships from literature for the homogeneous structure. Um, where we get a slightly different um, size as well as if you notice the blue curve is now outside the red curve. So in other words, it's showing aluminium is actually stronger. Now this may occur simply because of the grain sizes that they were considering, which could be related to how that metal was treated. But if you look at the comparison of the equivalent plastic strain um, with and without microstructure, you notice there's definitely going to be a difference in the peak values that you're going to get. Um, at any given time frame during the simulation, as well as you notice the difference in jetting. So another thing we're looking at now, because we see this difference in equivalent plastic strain, what we want to look at is the effect of equivalent plastic strain, heat dissipation, and the temperature changes. So what I've plotted over here is temperature for the inhomogeneous and homogeneous or oh, be homogeneous basically means um, neglecting the effects of grains. So comparing the two um, within this sort of margin, which is x equal to 0 0.2 millimeters and x is equal to 0 0.4. So I'm basically looking at this region over here. And that's what we've plotted in the graph on the right. Um, so if you look at the inhomogeneous versus the homogeneous for the equivalent plastic strain, that's the blue curve, you notice for the inhomogeneous, you get numerous peaks compared to the um, relatively smoother homogeneous model. Likewise, for temperature with the inhomogeneous, which is a solid line, you get these numerous peaks occurring. Whereas for the homogeneous, which is the diagram at the bottom, you get relatively fewer spikes. So there's definitely an influence of microstructure on the response that we're getting in terms of heat dissipation, the temperature profile, the jetting phenomena and to give you an idea of what it looks like. So this is a picture with um, microstructure. I didn't get, I didn't manage to get a picture without the microstructure, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, what the well formation really looks like. And again, this is on the order of, this is sub micron. Now, if we look at the effects of collision velocity versus temperature, um, the inhomogeneous is in blue. That means we have microstructure when we consider microstructure. And the homogeneous, when we neglect the effects of microstructure, is in orange. And what the first thing you notice when you look at this collision velocity, collision velocity, if I go back, is basically if I track a point where this is connecting, and I track that point as the mouth of this weld closes up from left to right, that's what you call collision velocity. So the velocity in the x direction for this particular um, schematic. So if we track collision velocity, which is at Vx, we notice that different profiles. Now the area under velocity time curve, if you integrate it basically, will give you the distance. So it also shows you the amount of weld that is being formed. Um, the area under the blue curve is actually substantially greater than the area under the, under the orange curve. So you actually get a larger weld zone when you include the effects of microstructure. To give you an idea of jetting, what we've done is we've extracted 
a few different time frames. I couldn't extract the exact same time frame, just given that the homogeneous um, model didn't really have that much jetting in comparison to the inhomogeneous modeling, where you see so much volume of jetted material um, coming out of the mouth of the weld. And yeah, with that, uh, that's the that's all I have uh, for today. Uh, I will take uh, questions at this point, um, but just just for the sake of it, I'm going to say you you're welcome to look at our research website to find out more about our research. Um, I've just shown you three papers that we've been working on, and there's much more um, in case you're interested in pursuing research in the future. Thank you very much, Samara. A great presentation. You. Uh, You'll make a great one professor one day if you want to do that. <laughs> okay, so if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to either un unmute your mic or uh, or uh, type something on the chat. Either way is okay. In the early portion of the simulations you were going over, you said you didn't do the powder because of computational resources. But right. what sort of elements would you have set up for the powder? Would it be like a single solid thing made up of the multiple crystal structures no 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 so you what you mean is in in a finite element model correct yes okay let me so let me show you two different ways of doing it um what you see over here is and i'm going to zoom in the best that i can so here's one way of doing it if you look at this image what i've done in the scanned region is i've just used a very very regular cubic mesh um, with a very high mesh density because it allows me to capture um, the dimensions of that melt pool and heat affected zone in this region with a lot of fidelity. Outside of that, I don't need a very fine mesh. So I then go with a coarser meshing strategy, but I gradually coarsen it as I move out. The effects over here, right near the boundary of this powder region, are things I'm not really interested in anyway. I'm not even going to look at that. So I can use a very coarse mesh over there and it's not going to affect my results at all. Uh, uh, now, the okay. other way of doing it is, you see all of this extra stuff on the side um, is going to increase your computational time significantly. So another way of modeling it correctly is if you can calibrate how much heat is going to be taken away by conduction and replicate that with an artificial um, convective heat transfer coefficient from that surface. All right, thanks. Yeah. All right, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. Again, thank you, Samir, for a wonderful presentation. And, uh, you know, throughout the, the course, we'll probably have a couple more of these presentations from, from students as well. So it'll give you um, a nice sort of... Um, you know, flavor into some of the research that depends on the knowledge, you know, that you have to learn in the course. And so, um, Sumer, maybe, you know, I don't think it was maybe three years ago you took this course. And although you'd studied some of the concepts before, I think taking this course helped improve your finite element simulation capabilities so that you could do some of these things. Maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about your learning curve um, in in uh, finite element simulation. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start the story a little before that. So this was back in in India when I finished my undergrad. Um, I was very good at CAD. I, I knew a bunch of different CAD packages, and one thing I was always apprehensive about was finite element analysis, uh, or basically CAE, computer aided engineering, um, simply because I had no exposure to it. And I'd never heard of Abacus. We heard of ANSYS. We heard of um, Altair Hypermesh, which I, which I know Akash knows about. Um, but I'd never, I never had any resources to learn any of this. Um, we also hear about how CA analysts get high salary, higher salaries compared to people who just do CAD work at large com at major companies. So it's something I always wanted to learn, but I never had the opportunity to learn. So when I came to UTD. Um, they didn't have the course, and then Dr. Malik finally introduced it in 2017. Um, so that was my first time being exposed to uh, a CAE software, in this case, Abacus. I had no idea that Abacus was so widely used for research. I had no idea how to use it, uh, nor did I know what kind of capabilities it, it had. So Abacus is definitely a very, very powerful software. It doesn't have all of the 
automation that Ansys has. It forces you to do things yourself, but it also offers you a lot of room to create your own modules or write your own subroutines so that materials can behave exactly the way you want them to behave based on whatever sort of experimental characterization you've done. Um, obviously, I'm talking about very advanced stuff. You have to start at the very basics and then build up. Um, don't don't look at something very advanced first because it'll put you off. Um, I struggled with with it when I took Dr. Malik's course. I, you know, if I think about it, um, when I took Dr. Malik's course in 2017, I had really struggled with the homework because I'd never used this before. Now, if I had to do the same homework, it would literally take me five minutes a piece. But um, you know, you start somewhere and then you just get better. It happened, the progression is natural. So if you are struggling with Abacus or you never used it before, um, you know, don't expect wonders overnight, but as long as you uh, keep yourself motivated and you keep working towards uh, solving more problems and you know, write down whatever difficulties you've had and how you managed to over overcome those errors or whatever pops up, you will learn and you will definitely see a learning curve getting more and more aggressive. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that uh, advice, sharing your experience and everything. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to see how far uh, these simulations and the research have come. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and stop the recording here in, uh, in a moment. And then if anybody has any uh, final questions that they want to ask uh, separately afterwards, then, then I'll stick around uh, for a few minutes as well.